Okay, we're in the fifth chapter in Deus. Rabbam writes, Just as a wise man is recognizable due to his wisdom and his perspective. And as a result of people recognizing him that he's another caliber of person due to his wisdom and his perspective, which is not an ordinary perspective, but they understand that something has to be respected and even revered. He has to identically display that his actions and his eating and the way he drinks when he does his ordinary mundane actions, when he speaks, when he walks, the way he dresses, and the way the way he negotiates, he negotiates differently. It's a more refined. He does it with astuteness, but with integrity. A wise man, it has integrity. His perspective, it, it's not only, it's wisdom coupled with perspective, which is appropriate perspective. You know, it's interesting. Today, we live in a one niche society that in Wall Street, a person can be, doesn't miss a beat. Financially, he's one of a kind. But every other aspect of his life, what is he? He's his life's a disaster. He has no control the way he eats, the way he behaves, the way he speaks. It's one niche. When we speak a person as a wise man, wisdom is the totality of the person. And he, because he has that wisdom, he also he has a perspective. If his w wisdom is of such a caliber and the perspective is correct, the person automatically, if he it's totally internalized and integrated his being, he's going to behave differently. Because he sees other people's behavior being not appropriate, not sufficiently refined. He's not going to behave that way. He's not going to eat like a glutton. Because if he has wisdom, he understands you eat to live. One doesn't eat, one doesn't live to eat. And even the way it's, even if you understand that, it's with a level of responsibility. You dress differently. You don't dress ostentatiously. You dress because of what you represent. You dress which reflects who you are. Unless you want to conceal it. Conceal means in an appropriate way. It's no fact to Chofetz Chaim. The episode pictures of the Chofetz Chaim. He was a man who knew everything. He, had, he was even divinely inspired. He wore a fisherman's cap. He wore an ordinary coat. He did not dress in rabbinic garb at all because he wanted to conceal who he really was and all the people closest to him ultimately wasn't recognized how special they were. He was speaking about the wisdom due to the wisdom he, it, he shouldn't dress in a way which would be contradictory to what he is. Being humble, being anonymous, being under the radio, radar is not contradictory to be wise and having proper perspective. That goes in sync because being humble is part of understanding what it's all about. The way one eats. One eats simply, not ostentatiously. You know, it's interesting. The Talmud tells us that Judah the prince, Rabbi Danosi, he was called Rabbeinu HaKodesh. He was called the Holy Rabbi. The Holy Rabbi. And he was called Rabbeinu. Very few people in the history of Jewish people call Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu means he's the teacher of the Jewish people. Moshe has the title Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, our teacher, he taught Torah to the Jewish people. After Moshe Rabbeinu, the only person who assumed the title Rabbeinu was Judah the prince. He's called Rabbeinu HaKadosh, the holy rabbi. Why? Because Judah the prince is a Torah violation that you're not permitted to record the oral law. It has to be committed to memory. You're not permitted to record it. Judah, the prince, is the redactor of the oral law. 
the Mishnah was authored by Judah the Prince. It's a Torah violation. It's based on verses. You're not permitted to record the oral law. It has to remain committed to memory. It shouldn't be recorded in writing or in any other way. So what was the basis for Judah the Prince's decision, which wasn't contradictory to, to the halacha? There's a verse in Psalms, in Tilim, with Dover Mel says, There are times in history when you must do for God, because if you don't do for God, the Torah will be nullified. If the Torah, the basis, without the oral law, the written law means nothing. Because every verse in Torah is open for endless interpretations. That was the basis for the argument of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed, which is what we believe, that not only is the written Torah divine, even the oral interpretation is divine. And we have an unbroken transmission from Sinai till today, what exactly that transmission was of the oral law. And that's the Mishnah. Because of the Romans' prosecution and decrees against the Jews, Judah the prince who lived, who had a very close relationship with the Roman emperor, understood that unless he commits the oral law to writing, because of the decrees and the hardships the Romans brought upon the Jews, they, begin, they would begin forgetting. And if you begin forgetting where the Torah, the oral law is committed to memory, that's the end of Judaism. There, there will no longer be a Jewish people. As a result of that, based on the verse in Psalms, the times you have to do for God, because otherwise Torah will be annulled, he recorded the oral law. So why do we have the Torah? Why initially was the Torah given to the Jewish people? Who was our teacher? Moshe Rabbeinu. Why do we have the Torah? Why did it not go into the into the dustbins, Chasrishon, God forbid, of history, into the oblivion? Because Judah the prince made a decision based on this verse in Psalms that he will be the redactor of the oral law. So that that we have, the written Torah and the oral Torah today, fully intact as it was given at Sinai, is all because Judah the prince. So Judah the prince is Rabbeinu HaKodesh. He's the holy rabbi. So just as Moshe Rabbeinu was called Rabbeinu, the teacher of the Jewish people, Judah the prince also merited the title of Rabbeinu. He is the teacher of the Jewish people. Because we only have Judaism today because he recorded the oral law in the Mishnah. That's that's the background on this. Now, Judah the prince was a prince. Before Judah the prince passed away, he raised his ten fingers to, to heaven and he declared, Hashem, I did not benefit from this world as much as my pinky as my small finger. I had no benefit, meaning whatever he benefited from this world, it was purely, fully for the sake of God. Never a moment for himself. Judah the prince was a prince, a prince is the equivalent of a king. He lived in a palace. He wore regal garments. He wore his shoes, were regal. Everything about the Talmud tells us that there was no delicacy. Despite season, or fruit or vegetable that was not on his table, because that's the table of a king. A king has everything there, because anything less than that would automatically tarnish the image of him being the, 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 the leader. So, I mean, here he lives in opulence, in, in ro like, like royalty, because he is royalty, and he raises his hands to God and says, I did not benefit as much as my, my sole finger in this world. I mean, how do you reconcile the two? The answer is very simple. Judah the prince had an obligation to behave. He had to behave that his role as the prince, he was the leader of Jewish people. And the context of his leadership was as prince like a king. So to be able to have the persona and have the effect and the influence of a prince, he had to live a princely life. His residence was, was, was a palace. His garments were regal. His table was set with food and delicacies, which only was befitting of a king's table, but had nothing to do with him. I am this humble nobody. I'm a servant of God. Whatever I do, whatever I have, why it is this way is only purely so it should be a sanctification of God's name. So Torah and the leader should be revered as the Torah leader of the Jewish people. The Talmud tells us the time of the Beis Amigdash, the temple, the vessels, like in the Mishnah, were made of gold. What, what would happen 
and the vessel would actually wear down and it had to be repaired. Did they ever repair a vessel, a gold vessel in the in the in the base of Magdush in the temple period? Whether it was gold, silver, copper, you say copper doesn't have that good value, but silver is more. What about gold? Never appeared a vessel. Why? Because a, a king, you never, if a vessel, gold vessel becomes worn, you know you don't repair it. It's always replaced with a new vessel. Because we're fixing something, who fixes something? The one who cannot afford to replace it. But a king, which is royalty, anything less than the ultimate is inappropriate. So since in the Beis Amigdash you serve God, God, one does not bring anything which actually is considered a repaired whatever it may be. If it's worn down, it's replaced. That's the way we esteem and we revere God because anything less than that is inappropriate. That's the understanding. That's called Eilanius Mokmashiris. Poverty does not rear its head in the context where wealth has to be displayed continuously. Because wealth is an indication of what? Of greatness. In the material, because that person has a certain level of representation in the world, in the eyes of the world, at, and it's respected. So it's not enough. The man is truly wise and has proper perspective. It displays itself in the way he dresses, the way he eats, the way he drinks, the way he speaks, the way he negotiates a deal with a level of refinement. It doesn't reflect any earthiness, any coarseness, any lack of sensitivity, because that's rooted in his wisdom and his perspective, which automatically, if he is what he's supposed to be, he has humility. And if he has humility, wisdom says, dictates, how he should behave and what perspective is. Perspective, why do I exist? What is the value of life? The Talmud tells us, based on a verse, that normally when you have a fruit, what is the value of its leaf? The leaf remains attached to the fruit as long as the fruit is developing because the leaf protects the fruit. But once the fruit is fully ripened, the leaf dries and falls off. But the Talmud says, regarding a Torah sage, his leaf never withers. Even his leaf remains fresh and vibrant. What does that mean? So the Talmud tells us that Talmud Chochem, that a Torah person who is a Torah scholar, that even his divrei chul and his ordinary talk, but his ordinary vernacular, when he speaks, tzorach limut, you have to study, you have to learn from it. He goes in and when he speaks to the counter person at the bakery and he asks to buy the loaf of bread, you have to listen to the way he speaks. He doesn't speak the way everybody else speaks. He speaks with a certain, the words he uses, the words he chooses, how he says it, the voice intonation. When the woman gives, when the whoever the counter person gives him his change and he, the way he says thank you and the way he leaves with, with, with a thankfulness, that's so even his ordinary behavior, something which doesn't relate to his performance of mitzvahs, the study of Torah, or being involved in a, in a project which is a communal project. Everything is with the ultimate level of what? That his Torah and his wisdom and his perspective displays itself even the most ordinary aspect of his life. And that's what he's saying here. A person who's truly wise and has a proper perspective, it shouldn't remain limited to that. It should display itself in the way he speaks, the way he eats, the way he drinks, the way he behaves in his personal life. Not like a physical animal who's fully invested in physicality. Everything is only a means to an end. And if the person has that wisdom and has that perspective, it manifests itself and it develops and it's actualized in that same context. The Talmud tells us that you're able to evaluate a person if you look at three areas of his life, the way he behaves. The kiso, koso, bakaso. His pocketbook, that's what literally what it means, his pocket. His cup, the way he drinks, and how he gets angry. What does that mean? Let's say he's regarding his purse. What does he spend money on? When does he spend the money? How does he spend the money? 
that tells you a lot about a person. Is he miserly? Is he generous? And even if he's generous, for what is he generous? And when he withholds, what does he withhold from? This tells you a lot about a person. Then you have another person. He drinks wine. A person can drink wine one of three ways. Either you sip it daintily, you could drink it as a regular person drinks it, or you just gulp it down. But they call guzzling it down in the vernacular. If he drinks it daintily, sips it, not the way the average person drinks it, he's what? He's a Balgaiva. He's arrogant. He's pompous. If he drinks it in two gulps, in two sips, which we're talking about something that's like three ounces, he's an, he's an average person. If he just gulps it, he's a glutton. Gluttony takes it down in one, one, one swallow. That's gluttonous work, behavior. So that's his pocketbook, the way he drinks, and how he gets angry. Now, how he gets angry, to what degree he gets angry, how long the anger continues before he calms down, and for what does he get angry? That's a question. Some people, if you don't acknowledge them, you have a tempest brewing. They explode. Other people that get angry, if they fail, feel they were denied something they believe they should have had. A deal, food, whatever it may be. He's waiting on line. Even somebody cuts the line. How do you react to it? All these various reactions, how anger displays itself, it tells you about the person. Does he have self-control? Over what does he get angry? If you see Chasu Sholem, Pinchas ben Elos ben Aaron Akoid, who's the ultimate zealot, when he saw God's name being desecrated in the most extreme level, he could not tolerate the pain. He went with a with a vengeance, and he killed the prince of the Jewish people together with the princess, the Midianite princess, because God's honor was being desecrated publicly. Even it meant he would die. He didn't think he survived it. Didn't make a difference. So what did and what does God say? He expressed my vengeance, and therefore the Jewish people were not consumed. That anger, that vengeance was with purity. It came, it emanated from the pure source. Other people that get angry, where does it emanate from? From their ego, from their desire for honor and for, for food and for whatever else it may be. Amass wealth. Great, holy, special rabbi. His name is Avigda Miller. Today they distribute his Torah. It was translated into English. He's an American. In many shuls. I just saw it in Manhattan. Modern shuls. Very observant shuls. People, everybody reads it. He passed about 20 years ago. He was born in Baltimore. And he went to study in Europe in Slabotka, which was the famous Lithuanian yeshiva, came back, a great, great Talmud Chochem. And he was, he was a rabbi in Brooklyn of young Israel, and he was something, and he was a yeshiva in Berlin. He, was, he had a position there. And he was a man who was very special. Everything he did was calculated, that it was 100% in conformance of the Torah. Just to give you an example of the way he used to live his life. When he was already older, he was a widower. He has very special grandchildren. His grandchildren today are people in their early 80s. And um, the grandson walks into the house and he sees his grandfather's head immersed in water, submerged in water. And the grandfather didn't realize he came into the house, into the kitchen. The kitchen sink is filled with a stopper and his head is immersed in the water. Then he pulls his head out of the water and grasps, gasps for breath, takes a deep breath. And he says, 
thank God that I'm able to breathe. And all of a sudden he sees his grandson there. And he says, what are you doing here? He says, I just came to visit. He says, he calls us, Zayda, what are you doing? He says, you don't understand. When we breathe every moment, when we're healthy, do we appreciate that we're able to breathe? We don't appreciate it. By me denying myself oxygen, by putting my face under the water, I want to realize what God is doing for me, that my lungs function, I'm able to breathe. That's why I did it. Of course, we, everything we take, it's supposed to be that way. But it doesn't have to be that way. So they have every moment to be sensitive, to be appreciative. I have to be able to sense what God is giving me, that I have functioning lungs that I can breathe. This is what he said to his grandfather. Then his grandson says this. He has a crisp, delicious apple. Takes the apple, has a beautiful red skin. It's shape, it's firm. And before he says the bracha, the blessing to eat the fruit. He observes it, twists it, turns it, presses it to sense its firmness. And then he says the bracha and takes a bite out of this crisp apple. And he savors it. What did he do? First he looks at it and he says, look at this beautiful creation. God created this beautiful, attractive apple. The color of the skin. Its firmness, its shape. It's texture, and then he bites into it. The taste, it's sweetness, and how he's able to benefit from it. And afterwards, he's thankful. And say what this is. If you live your life, that every action you do, you reflect on it first, and then you internalize what it is. You become a different, you're a different human being. So if you observe this, this is ordinary behavior. This is not what speaking when he's praying, when he's davening when he's studying Torah, or he's disseminating Torah at a very advanced level. This is ordinary behavior. When he buys the bread, when he eats, eats the apple, he used to go for a walk 4.30 in the morning on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn when no one was on the street, when it was quiet, and he would walk by himself and inhale the air in the fall or in the winter. And he would say, Baruch Hashem, the quietness, the tranquility, the beauty, the world that Hashem has provided for us to live in. And this is the way he lived his life. There's nothing that he took for granted. And he was touched by everything. But what, what does that show? Does it say there's something wrong with the man? The man is preoccupied with, with nonsense. No. Due to his level of wisdom, and his retention of that wisdom, which is the Torah, and his perspective of why I exist. God's, the Nov prophet says, why did God create this world? I created for my glory. So the more you recognize God's glory in this existence, you're actually addressing, that's the objective of creation. King David says, when he looked at heaven, he says, heaven speaks God's glory. You went to the Hayden Planetarium when you sat there. You finished. What, what, what did you say? I got a stiff neck. What, what did you say? When he saw the stars, the heaven, he says, the heavens be God's glory. That's what he saw. No, don't get carried away. No, that's exactly what it's about. It's only because his foundation and his core is Chochmah's wisdom and perspective, which is integrated it's not wisdom for the sake of wisdom. The wisdom we study, it's as it says in Pirkei Avos. We study to be able to actualize the mitzvah, to do it perfectly and precisely at, very, at more advanced levels. That's the value of studying. You become a different human being. So uh, this kind of person, he's recognized not only through his, the way he dresses, through the way he eats, the way he negotiates a deal. The way he says good morning, the way he says good night, the way he expresses his appreciation. It's a whole different reality. Famous story of Yoshif. This has to do with Alan's uh, area. He had a very complicated situation. He had to be operated. He was about 97 years old. And there was only one surgeon from Cleveland Clinic, not Jewish, who could do this surgery. 
And it was a chance whether he survived the operation or not. Factually, it added about seven years on to his life because he had this operation. And there was one Jew in the United States who paid and he could only do the operation if he brought his own team and his own equipment. And they chartered a plane. He flew with his team to Israel. And during that surgery, Rabbi Yosha was awake the full surgery. And because, why? Because Rabbi Yosha was the leading decisor in the world. And it, to be operated where the, the, the odds are that you're not going to make it, you're not permitted to be operated. Then you're being killed. You only operated to extend your life, not to end your life. So every stage of the operation, he would ask questions to the surgeon. Where is it at? What are the chances? How do you see it developing? Uh, and he would respond, and he says, continue. And this is the way it continued till the at the end of the surgery. And the surgery was the success, as I said. He had seven years added to his life. And there were special years. The surgeon, after the surgery, he stayed in Israel for a few days to make sure it went well and he was doing well. He left, flew back to the States, came back again to check him. But then he did a tour. And he told his colleagues that he never met a man like Rabbi Yoshev. That a man who's being operated on, and it's a question any moment, he may not survive the operation. And he's interacting with him as if he's a bystander, in watching and learning, because he's advising the surgeon, could he go further, could he not go further? That's how removed he was from that. He says he never he never met a man like this in his life. This is the surgeon. And when I talk about a child, he was a middle-aged man, world-renowned cardiac surgeon, one of a kind. And he just couldn't get over Rabbi Yoshev. He saw the dimension of person, the way he spoke and the way he behaved. So what happened? He, when he came to visit him, maybe the second time, the third time, he wanted to thank him. Now, in Hebrew, thank you is toda. Or you say adank. But to say it in English, thank you, Rabbi Yoshev did not speak English. He spoke Hebrew, he spoke Yiddish, did not speak English. So he wanted to be taught how to say thank you in English. So when the doctor comes, because we find that modim, you cannot say thank you through, delegate thank you through a third party. You have to say it yourself. And when you say it, you have to understand what you're saying. And the person who hears it, it's not through an interpreter. It has to be heard directly from the person. See, he was trained, was taught how to say thank you. So when the doctor comes, he should say thank you in English, English so the doctor should appreciate what he had done for him. You understand? What does that say about Rebel Yoshev? I mean, as it is, the surgeon in the, is blown away. He's never met such a human being in his life. On top of that, Rebel Yoshev, his time was so valuable, he had to spend time, practice, had to say thank you. So when the surgeon comes, he should be able to thank him for what he had done for him. What does that display? It displays something beyond, beyond what behavior is. You say this man's too busy to even think about these things. The greater, he's never too busy to do anything that, that's, that is, is appropriate and has to be done. Now, years ago, Rabbi Shoslant used to say, what is a masmid? A masmid is a person who's diligently, diligent and vigilant in the way he lives his life as a Jew. So he used to say in Yiddish, I'm going to say it in English. He studies in time, he eats in time, he sleeps in time, and he relaxes in time. Everything has its time. A human being is not a machine. Everything has to have its time. That's a person who lives responsibly as a Torah Jew. Everything in its time. Because if you allow one to fringe on the other, ultimately you can't continue. And that's a wise, that's a wise man who's wise and has perspective. Because what is the objective? The objective is continue to be to be functional and succeed in what you're supposed to do. But if you overtax the system and the system starts failing, what have you accomplished? Now that's being penny wise, pound foolish. I'll do it now, and what's going to be? At the age of 30, the person will have a nervous breakdown. 
or have some kind of health issues because he actually overtaxed the system, he abused his health. It's not the way to live. A wise man does everything within measure. Everything's measure. Everybody has different capacities. When one person has the capacity, person another person doesn't have that capacity. Interesting, last week's parsha, not Kudai in Bayakel, he cites a verse from uh, from Mishlei that King Solomon says that the year of the poor man as a sweet as the rich man. And therefore it allows him to sleep. So the Mitchell says, what are you talking about? This is the wisest man speaking. A poor man doesn't even, doesn't satisfy his basic needs. He goes to bed hungry. And he's worried where the next meal is coming from. How do you say the, 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 the year of, of the poor man is as sweet as the rich man and he allows him to sleep? So the Medjish says, very interesting. A person lives 40 years. And after 40 years, God says, well, I'll credit you for the 40 years of your service. A person lives 80 years. And he he's accredited for 80 years of service. So the, the man who lives 40 years says, you know, it's not fair. If you would allow me to live 80 years, I would have performed for 80 years as I performed for 40 years. Hashem says, as a result of that, if you live 40 years, and if you would have lived more years, you would have continued succeeding and performing, especially your credit is if you lived 80 years, although you only lived 40 years. Therefore, the poor man, the man who has less years, although he didn't live those years, he's fully accredited. Therefore, he could sleep, even though he doesn't have the years, he has the full credit of the 80 years. That's the way it works. Because again, why does a person die? Because God deems he should die. You want to do the mitzvah. Same idea. Something interferes, doesn't allow me to do the mitzvah. You get full credit. I want to live another 30 years, which within the, the, the times, the lifespan of a person. For whatever reason, God cuts the person's life short. Not because he's being punished, but because he that's he's only meant to live so many years. But the man says, it's not fair. The man who lives 80 years, he gets more credit. I would have performed as well, even outperformed the other guy, the other person. Why should it be sure change? Hashem says you're fully credited. That's the understanding. So it's, it's again, it's it's a manifestation of this concept that if you're committed and you would have done it, although something interfered did not allow it to happen, you're fully credited as if you actually actualized that mitzvah. And people are special people. I'm not going to mention any names. And when you meet them, and when I speak about them, I say, the person's truly a prince. His behavior, I'm not only talking about what he, what, what he does and what he has done, but the way he interacts with people, the way he carries himself, his behavior is princely. That's what it is. When people see him, they're like enamored by him. They're impressed with him. And as much as and as long as they could be have it interact with him, they want to extend that 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 interaction because the person is so special. Because that person, what he is, it's not only what he is in wisdom, in action, but even he displays who he is, the way he speaks, the way he dresses, the way he interacts, his sensitivities. That is the totality of that kind of person. And this person, you can learn from even his, his most mundane act. There are volumes that you can learn from that of what is there. And there's a lot more beneath the surface than you can even imagine. You speak about the tip of an iceberg. You see the tip of the iceberg, but the majority of the iceberg is below water. You don't see it. That's exactly what these people are. I remember many years ago, there was a person, his name was Moshe Shera. The Moshe Shera. Zechot Tzarek the He was dead at Agudis Yisrael. And he was a very special person. He died in his early 70s of cancer. And he had relationships with the presidents of the United States. He had relations with senators. And he was a walking Kiddush Hashem. He was really an orator. He was intelligent. 
He knew exactly what to say, what not to say, and his record was impeccable, what he did for the Jewish people, what he did for Israel. And he once asked me, I had a little bit of a relationship with him, he says, he'd like to have a meeting with Ira Rennett. Never never met. He wanted to meet Ira Rennett to speak to him about a certain project. The story goes back, he's, he's gone already 10, 20 years. So I said, oh, I'll do whatever I can to get to get the meeting. Set up the meeting. So I see, I read it two days later, and I say to him, this person, Rabbi Moshe Sherry, is that I go to Israel, which he heard of his name. I said, the man is a prince. I think it's worthwhile to meet him. But I, I the way I coined him and framed him, I said, he's a prince. Because every aspect that we spoke, he spoke intelligently. Nothing came out of his mind, out of his mouth, which wasn't thought out and spoken well and appropriate. That's what he was. And he was impressed. And he says, look, if you if you say so, I'm happy to meet him. And we set up the meeting. But that's it. What he is, what they say is, that's the way he displays himself. This is really what we're talking about, Tocho Kibaro. It's not only what's on the what's on the inside should be on the outside. It should be displayed. Because usually it is. He was the he was the greatest Torah sage of his generation. That's how great he was. He was one of a kind of orator orator. And he had it. He was a handsome man. And when he walked into room, you felt his presence. And he dressed like a prince, dressed like a prince. His captain, he wore a high, like a Lithuanian yarmulke. And he was impeccable in terms of his level of cleanliness and his, the way he walked. Everything was, was stately, princely, that's what it was. And the Vilna Gon lived in Vilna. And the writings, the manuscripts of Vilna Gon, what he'd written, were under lock and key. Nobody was permitted to use. They were the original manuscripts. Rabbi Yisrael Salanta would have a key to the, whatever they called it, the safe, the vault, where the writing, the manuscripts were. were. And he would go there, open up the location he had the key, take out a few manuscripts, walk into the main synagogue in Vilna, sit down at a table, and put on his glasses, and he would sit and he would study the manuscripts, the writings of the Vilna Gom, and people would observe this. And it was such, it was, it was, um, it, was it was a sight to, 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 you could imagine what it was, a prince, everything radiated holiness, princeliness, the, op the perfect human being. It was a Kiddush Hashem. Like sometimes you see a person like, who is he? Sometimes you see the guy's dressed so outlandishly. You say, who is this guy? He belongs in the insane asylum. They should have committed him. Another person, who is he? he? He hasn't bathed in six months. The guy speaks with a level of, 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 of vocabulary. He shouldn't be, he shouldn't let decent people to be exposed to his language. Bahavdil. These people, even before they speak, you see them, you, you sense what their presence is. Tell you, just end with one story, which I'm not.